Okay, well, we shall get started. Um, so welcome to the second monthly edition of Aon's Independent School Board Mastery Series in partnership with Govern With and Governance Institute of Australia. I'm Lynette Walsh, National Client Director at Aon, and I also have the privilege of being on Aon's leadership team for education. Before we start, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and pay our respect to them and to their cultures and to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today, I'm joined by a very esteemed panel of experts, the wonderful Tracy Kane and Fee Mercer. Tracy Kane is the CEO of Australian Public Affairs, a strategic communications consultancy with over 25 years of experience in independent schools. With a background in journalism and political advisory roles in Australia for an education minister and the USA, Tracy has worked with more than 400 independent schools and schools associations on governance, reputation risk, market research, reputation building and issues management. She is the director of the Association of Independent Schools of New South Wales and of Knox Grammar School in Sydney. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. And we've also got the very wonderful Fee Mercer. Fee Mercer is CEO and founder of Govern With, a governance review and capability development technology platform for highly regulated not-for-profit industries. Her platform is used by over 600 boards and 6,000 directors, producing powerful governance data insights. She is a governance specialist with over 30 years of executive and governance experience and has completed entrepreneurship, innovation and venture capital studies at Haas Business School in Berkeley in Silicon Valley. Her most recent governance roles include Wesley Mission Queensland, Dairy Food Safety Victoria, Bendigo Health, Bar One Health, and National Heart Foundation. So as you can see, we've got a very good panel for you today. For those of you that attended our first webinar, you'll know now that the purpose of this um, webinar series is to do a deep dive into the underlying governance issues that lie behind the top risks identified in Aon's 2022 Independent Schools Risk Report. To recap on the findings of the Aon survey, which were captured in the report, the top five risks are seen here. What is interesting is the pivot to these risks. So in our prior survey in 2020, only one risk actually stays stagnant, which is student safety, which really shows the disruption that the past few years has had um, on the school sector. And what the report concludes is that during the next two years, there's going to be more disruption. And for schools to be able to ride through this um, as successfully as possible, you really need to have incredible, really robust processes for governance and risk management. So that really is the reasoning behind um, our webinar series, which is focused on governance. Today, we're going to unpack the top risk, attracting and retaining top talent. But more specifically, we will focus on the board's role in this respect. And I think that you'll find we've got some really interesting insights to share with you. So, Fee, with that, I might leave it over to you to talk through the agenda of the day. Thank you so much, Lynette. And Tracy, I'm really looking forward to going through this fabulous subject with you both today and sharing some of our really most recent insights. Our agenda today for the next half hour is what does talent mean? Like, what is the definition? The right talent attraction and engagement strategy and leading a contemporary ESG, which is environmental, social governance culture. And how can that support a, re a really successful retention strategy in this incredibly and fiercely competitive environment? So, Tracy, let's start with you. What does talent mean to you and to all those you work with in the education sector? I think this is a very interesting question because historically you wouldn't see the board of an independent school getting into the weeds and getting involved in operational matters such as the hiring and the attracting staff and retention. Sure, they'd keep an eye on the statistics mm -hmm. and they would look to see where the trends are and whether they do need to step in, but historically you would never have seen them step in. And I think the real shift over the last couple of years um, has been twofold. One is the, the, real, the real challenges to workforce 
and mm. the the issues that that presents to a school if they cannot get the right workforce and it's become much more acute than ever before. So I think that the risk matrices of the um, of the governance bodies now include that as a, as a major risk in any school environment. Um, secondly, there is also a question around succession. And particularly for independent schools, you have you have a lot of boards and remember they're largely voluntary boards, but not completely. Um, they give their time on top of their full-time job. And so coming through COVID, which was very intense for boards, you now, you now find that they're talking about succession and there are, there are changes across the board level of schools for because people are exhausted, they feel they've done their turn. Um, and equally, there wasn't much change during COVID. So as you start to talk about succession, you start to think about, well, where's the talent coming from? Where are we getting these people? And I think that that twofold risk is what's really attracted board interest and made this a governance issue when previously you would think of it as an operational matter. That's really interesting and a, and a really good observation. And Tracy, just to add to your comments, that is what we are finding sectors wide, not just in education, Lynette, um, also in the health sectors, the human services. Uh, you know, all of those regulated not-for-profit areas, boards are now starting to hear and learn about workforce. So, Lynette, tell us about this incredible report. And, Tracy, also I'm going to get you to really comment on this as well. So it was really clear um, in the findings of the reports that um, was partaken by principals, board members, business managers, bursars. And you can see there the um, the percentages of, of the... Um, population that that did actually respond to the survey and um, what we found was um, that more people were actually less confident about the ability to secure enough skills and what is um, you know a, a, a talent space that is hard to get the right people both in terms of their aptitude for for teaching but also actually how they fit culturally and um, so we did see a, a huge increase a 50 percent increase and the number of participants that actually felt less confident. And to your point, Fee, I think, you know, this isn't something that is limited to ind independent schools, but certainly something that is closely felt um, by the schools community around the country. And Tracy, for you, this is uh, even more insight into what you were just talking about before. I, I think that number of 50% is really interesting. Um, and when you look at the breakdown of the survey respondents, you're starting to see that real mix between governance is starting to get concerned where historically it's been a um, an operational matter. And, and I think this is going to put it on the map because you are going to get the questions from a board level as well as from the principal level. And it's it's a very, very tough market. And when you overlay that with questions around um, freedom of religion and around some of those other workforce questions about quality of teachers, um, you, you start to get an even narrower environment in the independent schools section, sector. Mm, no, that's really true. And um, so, Lynette, I think this is one of your most relevant findings. Yes. in relation to workforce in your risk survey. And so I think, you know, with, with again, really every industry and what um, we've, we've been through over the past few years, we need to be more creative. Um, we need to recognise that we need to do things a little bit differently. And that, mm. that really echoes the point that Tracy meant in that, you know, previously boards may have seen talent as operational side and the responsibility of the execs um, within the school. But um, it now really does shift to being a board responsibility. And that um, needs to be focused on the culture of the school and the community. And um, that is a key strategy um, to attract and retain talent. So we need to think about more innovative approaches and we'll walk through some of those today um, mm -hmm. so that we can really try have an environment that's sticky. Um, and, you know, all of us in, in our jobs, regardless of where we work, it's as much about the environments that you work in as well as the role that you do. So you need to feel that you are achieving satisfaction in the activities of your actual role and you see a career path ahead of you for that and it fits in with your desires but similarly the environment and the culture in which you find yourself 
really needs to mesh well with your own um, aspirations and beliefs. And, you know, that's something that there's specific rhythm to in the independent school sector. And, you know, whether or not you're a religious school or, or a non-religious school, it's something that really goes into that. Um, so that key to think outside the box and do things a little bit differently was for you, was one of the key findings of the of the report. Mm. Look, I think it's a fabulous uh, finding and uh, we're going to talk a, a lot more about this and go a bit more deeply into this. And so we're going to look at together three innovative strategies. The first one being environmental and social governance. And this is obviously a really important thing that we're going to talk a lot more about in further webinars. We're going to talk about demonstrated how to demonstrate staff and teacher value and that importantly, safety and well-being. So I might kick off with this discussion um, and, um, just with a little bit of data to help everybody uh, in understanding the real focus, um, some of the data behind the need for the real focus and, and building of attention around environmental social governance. In our most recent platform, um, that we've been working with across different sectors across the last six months. We've worked with over 50 boards, uh, over 520 directors, and the results of both their board governance questionnaires but also their director skills matrix has been absolutely fascinating. And when we look at the skills of directors alongside their important skills such as professional skills, you know, lawyer, accountant, past teacher and so on, we're looking at now how are our boards fitted up with the contemporary skills. And, of course, no surprise to anyone, but ICT strategy and governance, that's the lowest skill across the board, both at the board as a group and individuals. But a risk that has a higher impact and a slightly higher score, but still very low, well below 50%, is environmental social governance skills. And so moving forward, that in itself is impacting on some of the strategies that we're going to talk about today, because it's an area that we do actually need to understand how to have the right conversations at the board. So these findings uh, have actually helped us identify what we call a disproportionately impactful risk. In other words, it may not be the lowest score of skills or what we're talking about on boards, but we've discovered, uh, working with you, Lynette and Tracy, that in actual fact, it has the highest impact. And one of the key overall impacts that happens if boards and executives aren't living role modeling and sort of speaking the real value and purpose of the schools, it does actually lead to the staff feeling there's hypocrisy here and they become disengaged and the teachers um, uh, are disengaged particularly and they call, and this ends up being a very poor culture. So what we're looking at is uh, and the amazing chair of Dairy Safe Victoria, Anne, has taught me about this, that in overseas countries they talk about this a lot and we need to start talking about this more in Australia. We need to learn more about and understand what we're doing about our footprint, which is environmental, not just climate change, our whole environmental footprint. And we need to think about our handprint, which is people issues social inclusion, gender equity, people and culture strategies. This is important. We're going to unpack it more in our other webinars, but we're also going to include it in our discussion today. So, Tracy, how does this sort of stuff give us a competitive edge? What, what is going on in the world that you work in and what are some of the stories you have to support this focus on ESG? Um, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of the board members of the independent schools that I deal with have either corporate or government backgrounds and they're coming to the school board meeting and asking the question about ESG. And mm -hmm. it seems a little esoteric, but I think if the, those that dig into it 
a little more deeply, I think you'll find that most independent schools are at the pointy end of living those values and having that purpose because a high percentage of them are faith-based schools and therefore you have that written into your your DNA almost. It's just they don't think about it as ESG. And I I think it's it's interesting to see this this idea come up through the ranks and become a governance issue, um, whether it is the increase in student voice and therefore what is important to that next generation coming through, or whether it is about philanthropy. And if you're looking at a capital works project, how do you actually live your values in order to to get those additional donations from parents? Um, And equally around the board succession, as I mentioned before. But it's, um, it's a very important element. It does exist but it perhaps isn't brought to the fore. And where there, is a, where there is a disconnect between whether it's a board member, whether it's a principal, whether it's an individual teacher and the school's values and the expectations of those communities, you start to get issues emerging and you start to get, um, whether it's disgruntled parents or disgruntled staff or mass resignations from a board, you start to see a disconnect and the audience leaves because the, under, the underpinning value, of course, of an independent school is... Not every school is for everybody, but those who choose to go there really value the reason for their choice and they will fight for their choice and they will want to be comfortable that they have made the right choice. And that's where ESG is particularly important. And I think, Tracy, you mentioned there, um, you know, that it can actually be in the, the background or the subconscious of the board because it's it's just built into the culture, but bringing it to the fore is something that's critical. And we're certainly seeing that in the insurance landscape at the moment. Um, you know, for um, a couple of years now in our insurer negotiations for um, for the sector, we've been very strongly advocating why partnering with schools is, in fact, the insurance company's um, ESG. You know, it, it, they're doing the right thing by making sure that we're insuring these schools, insuring them properly at the right price. But equally now we're seeing a huge shift into um, we're generally not only on independent schools, but across the entire insurance market, a focus on the insurance companies wanting to see a formal strategy. Um, they're no longer really satisfied with it being, um, you know, something that's just part of the culture. They really want to see that a board has a well-formed ESG strategy. And I think for you, that's why, you know, having the separate webinar, webinars on this topic is going to be really um, beneficial for, for the independent schools audience. No, I would entirely agree. So when we talk about environmental social governance strategy, Lynette, the work that we do with all the boards, we discover that um, often when the board and the principal and the management get together, there is actually a lot going on. It's a matter of everybody knowing and talking about it. People and culture strategies that actually point to these things. And another really interesting thing that I see that really is enhancing um, schools, teachers in particular buy-in is they're actually putting and investing a lot into the diverse needs of their students rather than just relying on the teachers to do it who are profoundly uh, dedicated to doing it. They're actually deliberately putting money into that as well. And we'll talk about that more in a little minute. This is really an important strategy. This cannot be taken too lightly. And Tracy, you've got quite a bit of experience in this area. Yeah, I, I think yeah, every independent school will recognise the challenges of getting, say, a maths teacher or a physics teacher. Um, and the, the solution previously has been to find someone aligned to the values and the purpose of the school, but to almost throw money at the problem. And I think that's where boards first got their insight into the workforce challenges within a school because paying extra money to attract those particular teachers was a, was a decision that was quite significant. But as we move towards more creative solutions, I can see that boards will set the parameters around how much professional development could you could you include if that's what the uh, if that's what the teacher wants. 
how can we look at flexibility and is there more job sharing? Is there, you know, how can we make use of the, the online system that was created during COVID to actually give that flexibility to teachers? And where's the, where's the sort of career development? But where are those other skills that go around it that match the increasing expectations of the school? So how do you get skilled up on well-being? How do you get skilled up on thinking differently or managing um, a, a combined class and a big group of students who are learning at their own pace? So there are some of these other skills that need to come into it and, and they're valued by staff. So to attract staff, it's not a money question anymore. It is going to be a question about what else can you put around that that makes it attractive to not just come to a school but to stay at a school? Mm. No, that's a, that's a really, really good point. And just to add to that point, it's really interesting, um, Lynette and Tracy, in our work in the health and human services sector and aged care as well, when we talk to younger recruits for boards and for management positions, they talk to the fact that you can go onto the website of any of these organisations and within a heartbeat you can tell what is their commitment to this exact sort of thing, not just money but that social inclusion, that really thoughtful environment. So it's a very good point. What about the recognition and reward systems and activities, um, Lynette? I mean, this is Aon's yeah. absolute area yeah so we, we definitely find that um you know having a remuneration strategy is still very critical but to tracy's points and and your point fee it can't be the only thing that you look at um but certainly when we we analyze people moving um between firms so this is more generic not just independent schools we do find that um 77% of people have actually moved for a higher salary. So it is still important to be looking at that um, salary perspective and make sure that, you know, you've got some well-formed data um, and um, thought going into the salaries that you pay your people, um, because it is certainly still an important factor. But outside of that, I think this sector has a real potential, again, to be innovative and creative and how you can attract and retain great talent beyond that. You know, fee discounts for, for children um, or family relating to your um, teachers is a clear one. Um, you know, I've got a young child myself and the amount that I spend on schooling is just that I could cry. But, you know, it's really <laughs> important. Um, so, you know, you, you do need to be thinking about that. And, and certainly as well, and Tracy brought into it the flexibility and the online learning. You know, how can we maybe think about how we can um, have more flexibility in the working environments for, for teachers? How can we change things up so that they are um, progressing and learning new skills and utilising some um, online um, capabilities to be able to do that, I think, is, is really critical and something that we have um, great potential to do um, in this environment. Mm. No, absolutely. And th this is incredibly important as well, and this is our final sort of point. So to you, Tracy, this is about this dynamic work environment, and um, I'm really interested in your thoughts and feedback around this please yeah it's a it's a really interesting question over you know many decades we've done thousands I think of focus groups with teachers at all sorts of different types of independent schools and there is there is a uniformity in what you receive from them they're overloaded they're not respected they're teaching to a formula to get an outcome in a particular test it's not the calling they joined for and they're right and there has been this bracket creep uh, where instead of teaching history or teaching maths, um, make sure you've got an eye on the mental health of all of the, the students. Mm -hmm. Make sure you return the calls from parents or respond to their emails. Make sure you participate more broadly in the community life around the school. So there has been over this time this expanding list of tasks. And I think teachers have been overwhelmed. The really the really interesting thing in it is they've never lost the genuine care for the students and they've never lost that sense of I'm a teacher because I want to educate. I am called to this. It's not a profession. It really is a genuine calling. And I find 
the impact of COVID to be to be quite interesting around that because you, you've had this sort of development of these online environments and all of a sudden teachers haven't gone backwards. They've actually found new challenges that have really sparked up new ways to teach and new ways to engage with the students. And, and equally, how do you get rid of the bottom end of that logistics around teaching and actually focus on delivering the education? And it would be a real shame to me to see um, independent schools go back to the pre-COVID environment. COVID has now passed, switch off the system, let's go back to where we were. And the innovative schools aren't doing that. They're looking at we gave an afternoon off for sport or a group activity or for something with your family or to do something nice during COVID. Um, why can't we do that in the school week? Why can't we take some of those elements and move them across? And that is not just good for students and it's not just good for, um, for the board and for the executive. It is fantastic for teachers because mm -hmm. it increases that engagement and it increases that, um, that sense of I'm here to educate. Um, so I think there's, you know, part of, part of ESG is not just looking at those three categories. It's looking at what are the lessons from the past and what are the lessons from COVID that we can actually use to make a better environment to attract that workforce and to retain them. Mm, I think that's, that's so true. Thank you, Tracy And Lynette, we're going to um, ask for some questions from the audience now. And while we're just waiting for if anyone would like to write a question, did, I've got a question, but have you got any questions that you'd like to ask? There is nothing appearing so far in the chat or Q&A. I think one of the really important things that I'd love to learn a little bit more about, Tracy and Lynette, is the, the notion of happy students, happy teachers, and some of the innovative work that's done around that, because it seems to me that it's really important for boards to focus on teachers and so on. But the more I've read and the more feedback we're getting from our surveys, the more I'm learning that uh, there's another group that we can look after better that makes our teachers' lives better. So I'd, that to me is a really important discussion and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Tracy and Lynette, because um, I think that is an innovative strategy and it's slightly different to just focusing on the teachers. I, I think the emergence of that represents the, the sort of transition of talent from being purely operational to being a question of risk and a question of governance. And I would suggest that you will see more of that discussion at board level because it is about extending the parameters and it is about thinking creatively and sometimes that needs to be set at a governance level so that it can be implemented operationally. Mm, I think that's good. Lynette, have you in your work got... Yeah, I think certainly, um, you know, what we have found is um, what you've said there, Fee, that, um, you know, the, the teacher is calling us to look after the students. So we need to not only be looking at how to protect the, the teachers and their mental health and their safety and well-being, but also that of the, stu the students, because that is a motivator to, to having happy teachers too, um, as well as obviously student safety being a top risk. And there's, there's really creative um, resources available now that can help that. Um, AIA, for example, have a complimentary Healthy Schools program that they launched this year, um, which is all about um, trying to promote a healthier environment for students, be it in what they eat, but also their mental health. So there's a number of things available because I feel as a teacher, you know, you are now getting more and more pressure um, to be looking after your students beyond the working day. You know, we all know that um, this, the playground follows you home. And so we mm -hmm. need to try and relieve that pressure for the teachers as much as possible too. Um, so having a well-formed um, mental health program for students as well as EAP for teachers, I think is really critical for, for boards and executives and schools to be considering. Mm, and I agree. And when the discussion at the boardroom happens, it's about understanding the need to resource that and to, you know, maybe rethink the way that we automatically think resources should be spent every year. 
So what a fabulous conversation. So Lynette, I might hand back to you now and then I'll um, just talk to let Trace and I'll talk to everybody a little bit about what is a program that we have to offer. Yes. Um, so thank you everyone for um, your attention throughout today's webinar. Short and sweet, exactly 30 minutes. So we did our job, ladies. Um, we, we kept the conversation brief, but um, also I think really did um, touch on some really creative and much needed strategies for, for school boards and schools execs to be considering um, with respect to attracting and retaining talent. And, you know, we really do know and hope that um, we can help you succeed in this um, in this measure. So um, thank you so much for your attention and hopefully you find some good tidbits that you can bring back to the boardroom and not out for your school. Thanks, Lynette. And just to finish up, everybody, um, we're really proud to be partnering with Aon and, of course, with... Um, Tracy with, from APA and with the Governance Institute of Australia to provide a product that enables us to guarantee that we can support you into having a high functioning board. I mean, one of the key things that has come out of today is that continual need for our boards to be coming more contemporary, to, to see um, not just that they have to manage, you know, set strategy and manage risk, but they really do have to understand what the new and emerging risks are. So at Govern With, we um, have a fabulous program called the Boardroom Plus that enables not just the board, but individual directors and even executives, if you wish, to be involved in a review and development program that really does support you to identify not just your corporate governance responsibilities, but your contemporary responsibilities as well. We also partner with the Governance Institute of Australia who provide online courses. And as a result of your evaluation, you'll understand exactly which courses to do. And they have a massive choice of 18 specific for the education sector courses. And of course, we have the privilege of working with um, Tracy in her wonderful company, because when we do uh, review and development programs with boards and executives, you also do need to triannually have that external rigour, don't you, Tracy? You do. I think the the knowledge of how the sector works, the issues, the culture, and the sort of the overlaying environment as well from a regulatory sense is really important. Yes, I agree. So we just wanted to tell everybody that um, you'll all be getting a recording of our session today and that we're going to welcome you to come and have a catch up with us and have a deeper discussion about this and certainly um, a discussion about some of the supports and programs that we have available for you. Thank you very much, Lynette. Thank it's been you. been lovely with you today. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Fee, and thank, thank you, everyone, much. for paying attention. Thank you.